Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect Podcast, Episode 8. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano sphere and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So this podcast is going to work a little bit differently. It's actually a special. It's going to be all about the Cardano 1.4 release. We're going to be talking about Daedalus and everything that's new within Daedalus. And once again, I'd like to remind all the viewers that this is a back-end update, so you're not going to see a lot of user interface changes within Daedalus, but the raw processing power and things that are going behind the scenes, things that are going on behind the scenes are actually improving right before our eyes. We're getting ready for some monster releases in 2019, so this is very exciting. And if you're not familiar with what Daedalus is, it is the main official Cardano wallet to store your ADA. It's going to have a lot more functionality in the future. But if you want to get involved with Cardano, if you want to get involved with this project, I recommend that you go to DaedalusWallet.io and get yourself started, download it, and start understanding what is going on behind the scenes. And this is your entry into the Cardano ecosystem. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Rick. We have Rick and Sebastian as well as our co-host today. And we have some special guests from the Daedalus team, from the Cardano 1.4 update team that are going to really brief us of what's going on behind the hood. So Rick, how are you doing today? Hey, Philippe, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking and uh, glad to have everybody here today. Just as a reminder to our viewers, this podcast is also available on iTunes, Google Play, Libsyn, SoundCloud, and Spotify. If you want to use the audio only version, you'll have that available. Today's going to be graphically intensive, so you might want to switch back over to the YouTube video if you haven't used that yet. And today's episode, like Philippe said, is Cardano 1.4 Upgrade. Cardano 1.4 was released uh, December 18th. Cardano 1.3 was released on November 18th. So if you have not yet upgraded from any previous versions, Cardano 1.2 or earlier, make sure you upgrade to Cardano 1.3 and then using the DaedalusWallet.io webpage and then launch it, let your blockchain sync, and then through the blockchain, it's going to notify of the 1.4 upgrade, or you can just upgrade directly to 1.4. So today's special episode, we have several guests with us. We have Mr. Darko Majik, Mr. Nikola Glumak, and Mr. Matthias Bancourt, who are developers who were involved with the creation of Cardano 1.4, and there are a lot of changes. So I'm going to pass the mic over to these gentlemen. And they're going to give us a nice demonstration and throw explanation of what we're doing today. So uh, over to Darko, Nicola, and Matthias. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing today? Hello, Darko here. Hi, Nicola here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Matthias. All right. So uh, Darko and uh, Nicola, you have some uh, information and presentations that you're going to provide the uh, audience with. Uh, would you guys like to tell us? Uh, what's behind 1.4? What's all this work you guys did? Yeah, sure. So um, we'll switch over to screen sharing. We'll have a couple of things to to, to show you here. Uh, we have a presentation, but it's very brief. It's just one slide. Uh, today we'll be talking about Cardano 1.4 update, uh, which is uh, a compound product com composed of Dell's 0.12.0. .0 and Cardano SL 2.0.0. Uh, so all these numbers may be confusing. Uh, that's why we um, we wrote a blog post explaining how to be version Cardano. Uh, so uh, previously, Cardano product version was in sync with Cardano SL version, which now changed because we had some break, uh, breaking API changes in Cardano SL. And that's why we, we felt like uh, we felt the need to explain the whole story in the blog post. And, we could provide the link to the blog post uh, in the video description later on. But the, the crux of it, Cardano as a product is version uh, by its development phases. So currently, we are nearing the end of the Byron phase. And all Byron releases are uh, version uh, 1.10. And after, after Byron, uh, uh, we are, we'll be going to Shelly, Shelly release, and um, as we introduced, the decentralization features in Shelly, all those releases would be um, a number that's 2.10. Um, so again, uh, Cardano as a product is composed of two software components, uh, first of which is Cardano SL, Cardano Settlement, 
Git repository, and it's versioned by semantic versioning. And the other software component is Daedalus, the front end for Cardano. It actually ships with Cardano SL uh, as its backend. And it, again, it has its own repository. And um, it's version by semantic version scheme. So again, this is a very nice blog post explaining everything, especially uh, Cardano development phases. Um, you can find this information on, on Cardano roadmap website also, but I think it's very nicely summarized here. You guys actually covered a lot of things in your introduction, so we, we can start uh, with the content we planning to discuss here. So the main topic is uh, Cardano one point release. Uh, this is the most most important uh, or most significant update to Cardano yet. Even though, as you said in the, in the, in the introduction, most of the changes are actually under the hood. They won't be apparent to, the, to users, but hopefully uh, users will experience much less issues, especially uh, issues while using the wallet. And a lo lot, lot of connecting to network issues should be gone in this release. Later on, we will explain why. So uh, here we have like highlights, uh, most important updates uh, that we will be covering today. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be also covering some of the minor updates, if time allows it. So the, the major thing is we finally have Linux support. Uh, Linux was previously uh, supported only uh, as beta. Uh, Linux is now not in beta anymore. And with um, Linux support, we actually support all, all major operating systems, which is great. So we support Windows 7, 8, and 10, 64-bit versions only. Uh, we support uh, last three versions of macOS with Mac, Mac OS Mojave port, uh, which is introduced in this release. And finally, we have Linux. The Linux installer should work on, actually on all platforms, or sorry, on all uh, Linux distributions. Uh, but we have tested it uh, against Ubuntu 18 and Fedora 28. So the whole quality assurance process was completed on those two uh, Linux distributions. Actually, uh, we will, uh, after this introduction, we'll quickly show you how the installation works, yeah, because it's super simple. So we will do a live demo. So the, the next item is completely rewritten, rewritten wallet backend uh, with completely a carefully designed uh, new wallet API version one. And Matthias will be talking a bit more about this later. Uh, the important thing here is new wallet implementation uh, written against formal specification. And formal specification uh, basically works for any UTXO counting style wallet. So basically, uh, we are considering this very important contribution to space in general. And hopefully, other projects will build their wallets using our formal uh, specification. The next thing we'll be covering is optimized block storage. So we've significantly reduced the uh, number of files to store blockchain data. So we'll be covering that briefly. And we have improved process management. This thing is important because it will eliminate some causes for network connection issues. And there are other minor things that we'll be uh, showing you briefly. Other things we can quickly cover if uh, time the time allows it is we can mention the our public testnet cardano finally has a uh, public testnet it's not the first one we had many before the mainnet launch that's how we prepare for the first mainnet release but since the mainnet release uh, we haven't had a uh, public testnet so this is also important and the last item is support portal we'll be moving a lot of content uh, from Daedalus website, or we actually moved a lot of content from Daedalus website to support portal. And that is very, very, very important because it's easier to manage and translate, and it's everything is in, in one place. OK, so this covers the introduction. And we can proceed with demo of um, Linux installation. <laughs> Hopefully, everything will work. OK, hey, Darko, uh, is it OK if I ask a question before you yeah. go on for, uh, to the mm -hmm. other slides? Sure. Uh, can you go back to slide two for just a moment, please? Um, I'm, I just want to touch on something for uh, the basic viewers. If you select slide two, in case people are listening on the podcast uh, and you can't see the slide, basically what Darko is describing here on the versioning is Cardano 1.4 is the overall software installation. The two different layers that he spoke to in the introduction there is Daedalus Wallet is version 0.12.0. That's what you're going to see in the title of your wallet whenever you 
install and launch it. And then the Cardano version is Cardano SL 2.0.0. I just wanted to point that out because that way people know what they're looking at on their web browsers for the average users who aren't as familiar with the versioning systems. And what you'll see on your Windows, Daedalus 0 0.12.0, followed by a sequence of numbers that vary depending if you're on Mac, Windows, or Linux. Uh, so just want to make them aware of that. And thanks for letting me put that piece in there. Yeah, uh, I think thanks for this explanation. I think it's also important to know that there will be more uh, components for Cardano as a product in the future. Now we have these two, but for example, I mean, introduce smart contracts, uh, they will be living um, on a second layer. So settlement layer is one layer of Cardano. We'll also have a computational layer. That's, that's where uh, smart contracts will live. And, um, and even Cardano itself will be broken up into uh, smaller software components. So we are uh, removing uh, wallet code from Cardano SL. It will be a separate component and things like that. So it's very important to establish that the difference between Cardano as a product and its, it, its components, and they all have their, their own versioning. So let's switch over. I have a virtual machine here uh, with Ubuntu. I've already completed the download. So this is the Dell's website. Uh, we have added um, Linux download here, and I have downloaded it. And now I'll just do the installation. Installation is actually super simple. I launch my terminal. And the only thing I need to do is type bash and provide bin file, which I downloaded from the website as an, as an argument. And that, that will cover like most of installation cases. We also um, have installation instructions here on the website, which cover installation, but they also cover some edge cases, which some users may experience. For those people that are not completely technical, sa technically savvy, this is he's talking about Linux here. So you won't have to put in these command prompts if you are downloading on Windows or Mac. So this is this is just for Linux, and I just wanted to make sure that that's apparent so people don't feel like they're confused or it's a little bit over their head. Uh, very good, thank you. So the installation is um, almost complete. Um, we can see that. State directory is now being created in, in user's home folder. And um, right after this is done, I'll be able to find Dedalus in my applications and, and launch it. Uh, the only limitation of Linux version of Dedalus compared to Windows and Mac OS, here is the icon, which is still located. Uh, the only limitation is uh, updates won't, we won't be able to deliver updates to the update system. Linux users, we actually need to go and download a new installation file when we release new versions. So here's the DDoS interface. It's connecting to the network. Since I have launched it for the first time, I'm being asked to accept terms of use and choose my language. And the syncing, syncing has been started. OK, I think that completes the <laughs> Linux installation. I think you all agree the installation is super simple. Any questions regarding this section? The only question I have on it, well, you've, you've already said that you tested this with Ubuntu 18 and Fedora 28. And I just want to add, if any of the users out there successfully test with CentOS or Red Hat or any other Linux variant, then uh, go ahead and leave some comments on Telegram or on the Cardano forums. And, and hey, I've successfully used it on CentOS. That way, you know, the community has a good idea. Uh, just want to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we can move on to move on to uh, Wallet Rewrite and we want API. So Matthias, um, would you like to jump in? And... Uh, right, that's actually a bit, well, complex to explain without entering into all the details because most of the work done there is not really observable for the users, right? So but I think we can actually talk about how maybe this, uh, well, semi-formal specification documents that has been created as part of this uh, rewrite. So, Prior to actually implementing these new backends, uh, we started first by define in a semi formal way how to do, well, accounting for UTXO based uh, um, well, models. That, so to speak, is not, as you, as you mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily specific to Cardano, but that's just specific to any UTXO uh, kind of accounting, like Bitcoin, for instance. And then from that document, we derived many, many things. And an actual uh, implementation using these documents uh, on two different sides. So first, 
as of course an I would say an inspiration to, to write uh, well to to drive the code uh, design the code architecture and everything that was needed but also as a way to test that code and compare that uh, the implementation behave uh, pretty much the same way as the specification expected to behave so because of the way the development was handled we were able to compare I would say a simulation of this uh, specification against the actual implementation and well the whole idea is to ex to expect that this simulation and the corresponding implementation behave accordingly uh, so that's I think the very strong point on that uh, on that part uh, of course well it's not as simple as just taking the specification and turning that into uh, executable code that would be like the ideal world so there is always some discrepancy between the actual implementation and the specification so that's why we also have additional testing on that the wallet spec itself is a document anybody can see so if you just right. you know search online like cardano wallet spec you'll find a link on cardano docs and you can see the pdf and so what IOSK team, the, the IOSK team did is they took that that spec implemented it in haskell code and that's what you did i believe and then you also formally verified it with cock is that correct um not exactly well you we verify some of the spec properties with cock but not the actual haskell code because you cannot really verify that with cock uh, without proper instrumentation i would say so that's more, a bit more complex so the spec has been verified and proved and then the implementation has been done and in the middle we came up with a way to compare the specification with the actual implementation but that's also pure haskell code here so we build a model of the specification in haskell we have uh, next to that the current or actual implementation running and we just compared the model and the, uh, the, the 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 actual code or the actual i would say uh, state and model uh, evolves um, accordingly all right a part of this effort was to make the wallet layer independent okay so now the cardano settlement layer which actually runs the blockchain and the wallet interface are two separate applications correct they're on the way right so mo most of the most of the work has been done towards that so soon the idea would be to also have that have two different uh, applications there so right now we still need the, uh, the settlement layer for a couple of stuff but most of the work has, has been done towards that. So, yeah. So can we expect in the future, anybody who builds a new Cardano wallet would be able to basically reuse the wallet layer. And so they can pick a backend, connect the wallet layer and then build their UI on top of it. Yeah. And it, it could be actually even more than that because the implementation as it is right now is divided in several parts. And I would say the core parts of this implementation is actually completely generic. So it doesn't assume anything about Cardano itself because it's only pure uh, UTXO accounting model and UTXO accounting specification. We also build the implementation this way such that if you want, for instance, to implement this, to reuse all that code for different cryptocurrency, you could also reuse all the core codes and still have all the coin selection, fee calculation, and various aspects related to the wallets already implemented for you. And then you only need to provide the right uh, instance of all this generics type, then the concrete implementation for your own cryptocurrency. And that's what we did for Cardano. But the core is still completely generic, so it could be reused. Does that make sense? Or I'm talking like different language for you? No, that totally makes sense. <laughs> and so what kind of lies in the future now that we have this independent wallet layer? So should we expect that for every day list update, there is also a wallet layer update? Or do we expect that now they'll kind of go their own separate ways? Uh, that's the decision we still need to make. But that's actually something that could happen. Yeah, that's the wallet gets updated and released independently from the settlement layer and, and so forth, right? Such so that we could have more uh, frequent updates, but on different scopes. So that's not entirely formalized on our on our side, I would say, but it's something we are working on as well, yes. 
So only one other question on there was as far as the testing and simulation. So some of the stuff you tested with cock was the remainder of the testing. It was just basically intensive human testing. We had to put in a set of parameters and make sure it works and it doesn't break anything. Well, cock is not really about testing, right? It's more than that. It's a proof assistance. So you're not testing thing, you're proving them, which is a bit a stronger kind of assumption. And it's just a, a way to help human rights actual um, logic proofs so you can find all those proofs or pretty much all of them uh, we didn't put like all the obvious proofs into the in the paper but pretty much all the proofs are in the specification paper that we mentioned earlier so you could get there and see what are those proofs and those were written with cock because that's you know what's what it what is actually useful and then yeah, I noticed Darko has the wallet spec up on a screen. Dark, can, can you kind of walk our viewers through the spec and sh show them kind of what it looks like? Yeah, OK. So well, there are many parts in there. And if you go like up to part three and try to actually get that, you pretty much get a working basic uh, wallet uh, out of that. The rest of the parts are more about optimizations and nice things to have and well, also ability to do rollbacks and different sort of operation of your wallets. But if you were, for instance, to create a very minimalistic wallet, going for the first three parts will already be quite, um, well, covering cover quite a lot of areas. And right, so if you if you look, for instance, at what is on the screen right now, you have the lemma number 3.2, and a small proof below that. So Cock is actually an assistant that helps you write this kind of proofs because that's something which is very i would say error prone if you just do it by hands as a human because you might just you know you may you make a typo or you don't think about all the cases and you, you maybe miss something so with cock you can pretty much specify logic rules you want to apply to go from a state to another and you do transitions from an initial state up to the the, the end uh, results you want to, to prove just by using logical transitions that can be verified by the software here, cock. In the, in the end, what you get is just a proof in the form of success, well, successive uh, equa equations of just this part. Then we, we can say it's equal to this part and this part and this part and, and so forth until the, until the end. And here we don't write at each step the transition rules that were used to, to get from a line to another. But those rules can be found earlier in the document, usually. So if you just try to say, OK, how do, how do I get to li line one to line two? You can just scroll up a bit and find the corresponding rules that tells you that this particular pass with these particular assumptions can be replaced by these other parts. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thanks for informing the viewers that are not able to see and they're just listening to the podcast, what we're talking about. Darko and uh, Nicola, I guess we can transition back to you. Why don't you take us through this entire process? What What exactly is going on? You know, let's let's move on to the second part of the presentation as to what went on to get this released yesterday. Uh, okay, um, but maybe uh, Matthias, um, are you done with what rewrite stuff, or do you want to briefly mention the new input selection and um, we want API or? We um, have well, maybe a few words if if you want, right? So. Well, I will be very quick on the API, actually, because the API was uh, well released in beta version as part of the previous release already. So most users that were a bit curious, I think, might have already seen the V1 API. And this particular release just finalized, uh, well, the transition from V0 to V1, such that V1 would be as at least as powerful as V0. So everything you could do with the previous version of the API, you can also do with the new one plus maybe a few extra uh, extra points, extra endpoints and niceties that we had it uh, because of, um, well, feedbacks from either users or um, exchanges as well. And on the, well, on the other hand, we also, so part of this rewrite and uh, whole refactoring, we are able to also review completely how the cone, the cone selection was done, which gives us also extra abilities compared to before. It was quite a big effort in terms of research. And this also um, gave birth to 
uh, blog post that is quite extensive about how the constellation is now working on Cardano and all the statistical uh, studies you can compute on that. And the whole the whole idea was to really put the emphasis on uh, well on privacy and security here to make sure that if you use the the, the right mode, you will uh, make the constellation work in such a way that well it will favor uh, input grouping. So trying not to reuse twice the same you know the same addresses and trying to very to to, to limit the impact. Uh, in terms of security that can that can occur during coin selection, right? Part of doing that also makes it possible to now uh, introduce new features. For instance, having the receiver pay the fees instead of the sender. So this is not yet part of the API because, well, that's also extra work to, to get there, but at least now the core code can enable us to do that. Can you um, explain your last point in a little bit more detail? The receiver paying the fees as to as opposed to the sender. What does that look like in in a real life application? What's what's the well, end goal for that? Right. When you make a transaction, uh, you select a bunch of inputs from your accounts, and then the wallet will generate corresponding outputs uh, uh, for the addresses you've selected, and it actually removes a small part of the output's amount, such that the node, when receiving the transaction, will consume that, that difference as a fee. And those fees are fixed or are known for the, the wallet and the node. Like it's it's kind of it depends on the configuration and, and what has been agreed. So you need to make sure to, to leave enough fees, otherwise the node will just reject the transaction. Uh, but then there is always the question of who who pays the fee. And right now it's always the sender in Cardano, right? So if you just send a transaction, you send, I don't know, one ADA, uh, you will have approximately 0 0.17 ADA of fee. And it means that the, the, the person you're sending money to will just receive a bit less. Matthias, would that be user selectable like if the receiver agreed that they're going to pay the fee for the transaction is that like a, a selection in the future that somebody would make yeah exactly exactly so it's not yet available in the in the ui nor the api because it requires more work but in the long run you could expect instead of you sender paying the fees have the receiver also you know provide a way to pay the fees instead of you that's that's very interesting, Rick, because we speak about e-commerce solutions in the future. And, you know, the one thing with the, the advantages of fiat, um, traditional fiat, is when you go to a store, you purchase groceries or you purchase whatever. It's always, you know, Walmart or X, Store X that's usurping those those fees. And, um, you know, in the future, if goods or services are being exchanged within the Cardano ecosystem, the the idea that the receiver can choose to usurp those fees makes it that much more uh, feasible for certain transactions to take place. I don't know if you would agree with me, Rick. I do, uh, because things like eBay, sometimes you got to negotiate who's paying the shipping costs or who's paying for the return costs if the deal was not what was expected. So I think it's a really good development to have in there that, that will be available sometime in the future. Um, and there's one other thing I want to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, Matthias covered the API, and when uh, he was speaking to the API, he referred to users. And so to the general public, non-developers like myself, people who are uh, traders, um, buyers, sellers, holders, when he refers to users of the API, that's basically software engineers. I am not a user of the API. API stands for Application Programming Interface. If I'm wrong, please correct me. So the user of an API would be a software engineer who's developing towards the Cardano platform. So when he says users in that context, it does not mean like me or you, the average uh, user of the equipment. Did I get that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. uh, exactly. Yeah. But uh, maybe we should also mention that um, like m major users of the API are actually the exchanges. The exchanges are running this code for their wallets, uh, where users are actually holding uh, ADA that they are training. So primary, primarily user of the API are the exchanges. Of course, anyone else will integrate with Cardano also. 
yeah ex exactly so sorry for the vocabulary here because yeah users from our perspective as backend guys are actual developers so it changes all well the Daedalus team working with us implementing the whole uh, front end right now is, is this api is it is it um business specific or exchange specific because there are certain features that exchanges may not be privy to versus the everyday person for example when staking comes out exchanges are not going to be able to stake ada so do you have to write a different api for them versus if you're sending something to ledger do you have to write a different api for them is it one universal api that plugs in everywhere or is it um, solution based or specifically customer based apis well, right now, this API comes with a node. If you just run a node, the node also serves uh, this API as an interface for uh, people, I would say, to communicate with the node and to interact with it. So as an exchange, you will use that API. If you are integrating, making a front end like Daedalus is, you will also use that API. So, well, that's pretty much a general purpose API covering all possible cases. Yeah, and we might in the future you know, uh, give birth to different APIs that are more uh, business oriented with very specific uh, use cases. But for now, uh, there is only one and that's the well, wallet backend API. Okay, okay, makes sense. So Matthias, if you wanted to add anything more, feel free to, but if not, we'll transition back to Darko and Nicola um, for them to continue their presentation. Uh, well, no, I will give the give them the mic to Darko and Nicola. Thanks. So the next thing we wanted to show uh, and this will probably to the end users is, is how to actually update and uh, migration of the data layer works. So here I have a uh, recorded video because like this is uh, not possible. Uh, it's not possible to show this in real time. Uh, so I'll just play it and I'll try to explain what's happening here and Nicola can jump in at any time uh, to and, and to add something. So here we have uh, that was running. And at this point, and this happened for uh, most of the users yesterday, I think, of December. We said they will get the update notification. And then they have two options. They have they can choose update and restart, which closes that was immediately, or they can postpone the uh, postpone the update, in which case that was will not shut down, but the next time they launch it, the, uh, the update will install. Sure. Um, so I see for those that aren't, don't see it, it says update number four. Do users need to be worried or concerned if their update number is slightly different? My update number was slightly different when I was downloading it yesterday. Is this machine specific or what advice can you give to users who'd have a different node update availability on their Daedalus wallet? Uh, actually, the, the, the that number... Uh, should be the same. This number is different because this is a testnet client. So you see the red label in the top right of the user interface. Testnet was launched on only recently, and so it had less updates. But it will probably get have more updates, uh, releases that are not yet released on main, mainnet for testing purposes. But users should get the same number, users of the mainnet client. I use the testnet client here because it's easier to use. I can use like uh, uh, testnet ADA, which is it doesn't have any value. And also the blockchain is much smaller because it was launched recently. So, but good question, good observation. Perfect. Okay, I will continue. In this case, uh, I've clicked uh, update and restart and the installation starts um, automatically. Users need to go through the installation steps. And after the installation is done, the levels will launch. So we will see that in a second. So here, those has launched. Uh, maybe I will pause here to explain that, like, we have language selection and accepting terms of use again here, even though we already had that OS installation. And uh, this is specific for this release because uh, we changed how local data is stored in that OS. So we are actually asking users to uh, do this again. And but it's not like a big, big inconvenience. And I received a lot of questions because people are very anxious. They think that they're going to have to put their private keys or their seed phrase back to make this new installation. Can you no. verify that that's not the case? Yeah, I can verify that, that that's not the case. This is uh, how a uh, screen informing you on exactly that looks like. It explains that the, the process is automatic. You don't need to do anything. So all metadata is retained. Your spending password stays the same. Your wallet will be 
the regulated. Uh, it just needs to restore, be restored uh, from the history of blockchain. So the whole blockchain needs to be traversed, and your transaction history needs to be restored. So this is just like screen explaining that to end users. And if I click play again, you will see how that actually looks like. So here's the wallet I had. I can see the balance immediately because the balance is resolved uh, from current UTXO uh, of the whole blockchain. We can recognize which addresses belong to you, and we calculate the amount of failure in your wallet. But to get the transaction history, you actually need to uh, wait. Uh, for a mainnet uh, client, the wait is about one and a half hours until your wallet is completely restored. And transactions appear as uh, blockchain is traversed. I have to add a question. Um, so some users are experiencing longer than one and a half hours wait time, myself I included. Um, is there anything that you can say about maybe it being con computer specific or what's going on? Why are some computers um, taking much longer and other computers are just zipping through the process? Okay, so first of all, um, we will come to, to to one of our items, uh, optimized block storage data on so we'll be partially covering the, 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 this, question there, this question there. But um, users with SSD will uh, have this process uh, done, be done much quicker because um, DDoS needs to traverse uh, the blockchain, and the blockchain is stored in a lot of files. And as we in introduced optimized blockchain storage, it reduces uh, the number of files used to store the blockchain data dram dramatically. The consolidation process is also happening at the same time. So for example, uh, if you have an SSD and you install this update, you will need to wait a couple of hours for your blockchain um, uh, uh, data to be consolidated. But if you have like mechanical hard drive, it could, it could take, take a day or so. And while that is happening, some of operations with that may be slower. Actually, as yes, now we covered uh, <laughs> most of the, the next topic, basically. So, uh, but just to, to, to explain it um, in a bit more detail, so far, Vedalus was using uh, one file per block for storing blockchain data, which is a lot of files. In Cardano, we have blocks every 20 seconds. So Vedalus was using approximately 1.4 million files uh, to store blockchain data for, for one year of uh, blockchain history, which is a lot of files and operating systems are slow when handling a uh, large amount of files. And there's also an overhead. Uh, so you are using actually more hardware space than the actual real data in files because files, the data is split uh, among a lot of small files. With, the, with this improvement, we are actually storing uh, uh, two files per epoch. And in Cardano, epoch is a period of five days. So instead of saving many, many files for each individual block every 20 seconds, we, we are saving two files per epoch for all epochs except the, the current one and the previous one. We are keeping those epochs as one uh, file per block because we need to handle like uh, blockchain rollbacks and stuff like that. So actually, uh, I have a folder here open with so this is the like local storage uh, of the Edelus. and there is a DB folder that's actually blockchain storage, and there is a new folder here epochs, and it contains as I said like two files per epoch. One uh, is uh, epoch file with all blocks, and one is index file. And as consolidation ha happens, the files with individual, individual blocks are removed, and these files are created. So currently, we are, I think, epoch 90, 90 uh, in Cardano. And so those two epochs are still stored as individual files. So my last epoch, my last consolidated epoch is 88. Interesting. So the amount of data from that from that 96 or 97 percent decrease from 1.4 million files to under 50,000 is that data has just been consolidated into a smaller number of files if, if if i'm not correct yeah smaller number of files and basically previously we were using around 10 gigabytes of space to store blockchain data now you see this number this is the information screen for for this folder now it's less than two gigabytes, so it's significantly problem. So the um, entire blockchain is still in there. Yeah, the entire blockchain is still in there, except the current epoch and the one before it. So how how long did this take to get done? I mean, that consolidation process seems very intense. And what if you could explain it in 
in simple terms, what exactly was being done on your side to consolidate those files? So the consolidation is basically reads all, all, the, all the files with blocks and then uh, merges them in uh, one file per box. So for, for, for five days of blockchain history. And that is an uh, intensive process because operating systems are not very good, or file systems are not very good with, with handling a lot, lot of small files. And it happens in the background and the process takes a bit longer because it's throttled. So if you just allow it to con continue uh, executing at the fastest possible speed, it would um, disable normal operation of DDoS. It should take around two hours for users with SSDs, and it could take a day or even two with uh, users with mechanical drives and solar machines. Tarko, I'm glad you clarified that because I had the misunderstanding where I thought my computer is re-downloading the entire blockchain, but actually what was happening is the software that you have implemented was reorganizing how the blockchain is stored. That's correct. That's how I understand it. Yes, that's exactly correct. The other thing is, if you if you haven't used DDoS for a while and you you launch it and it needs to synchronize synchronize with the blockchain uh, and the consolidation process is still not done, your syncing will be, be, be slower than before than usual. But as soon as consolidation is done, the syncing will be as quick as it was before. Thank you. Yeah, and so the update comes in kind of two steps, right? So the first step is the actual migration, which you see as the 0 to 100%. And after you've reached 100%, then it goes into the consolidation phase, which deletes the old files. Is that correct? Uh, no, actually, consolidation is happening in parallel. And maybe, Matthias, you can jump in here. I think consolidation is happening in parallel. Well, yeah, that's done by two different part of the, the sediment layer, I would say. And that's uh, also echoing what we were discussing before, that we have many parts in SL right now. So you have the part that is in charge of well, syncing with the blockchain, and it will also do the consolidation at the same time. So as block has, has received, they will just you know, start reorganizing them. And in the meantime, you, are, you have all the wallet code, all the wallet backend that is syncing also with all those blocks and trying to retrieve all your historical data with that. So this is quite uh, isolated and different from the consolidation because it just reads the block from the, well, you know, get the block from the node and, uh, and handles them in its own way, right? So the, the wallet maintains its own state and the node has it also in its own state, which is much bigger because the node has to deal with the whole blockchain. Whereas the wallet backend only cares about your accounts and your wallets. Yeah, thanks for the explanation. So it's an independent process. It's happening in parallel. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so what you're saying is that there's there's two independent processes going on, one of which is measured by the percentage bar, and the other one which is unmeasured, but it's going on in the background and may or may not take longer. Yes. Well, yeah, but they are, they are actually also dependent from each other in a way, because the wallet cannot restore data faster than the node, because the wallet, the wallet backend needs the node to have received the blocks to also for um, you know analyze those blocks and start retrieving the historical data from the block. So the progress bar you see is actually the one from the wallet, but it also corresponds and it's I mean follows quite quite accurately the the, the node one because they are just evolving at the same time. When the node receives a bunch of new blocks, then the wallet starts processing them, right? Yeah, so ultimately, in the end, uh, what you have is some period after it's done installing, the computer will go back and delete all the old DB 1.0 files so that you're having a lot smaller storage space on the hard drive. Yeah, yeah pretty much. OK. But at some point, you're going to have more storage consumed because it's doing both things at the same time. No, actually, uh, as it's doing consolidation, it's deleting um, old files. So that doesn't make money. Like the, the, uh, the amount of hard drive used uh, is being constantly reduced. Yeah. OK. Uh, but like again, the good point is that there is no visual cue in the user interface uh, for consolidation. The thing we see so here. Uh, is wallet restoration. So if you have 10 wallets, you would see a progress bar for each and every one of them. But okay. consolidation is happening in the background and 
you like to, to figure out if it's complete I can see how many epochs you have and the current epoch can all, always be seen on Cardano Explorer here's Cardano Explorer current epoch is 90 uh, we said last two will not be consolidated uh, I'm 88 so now that means I'm fully consolidated Okay, because the last two are stored normally, and then the previous are consolidated. That makes sense. That was a very good visual demo. Thank you. Yes, it was a very good visual demo. All right, and the other question I want to ask is that obviously this is a long learning process. A lot of users are reporting this is taking a few hours for them. And I want to clarify with the team, is it safe to close the Daedalus partway through and open it later to continue if your computer crashes? In the middle of the process, is it safe to reopen? Or can you, you guys kind of tell us a story on that? Yeah, um, it shouldn't be any different from um, closing Daedalus or uh, crashing it um, in any other situation. So forcing is not, never a good idea because things can get corrupted. But this doesn't change anything. You can close your Daedalus, especially if you close it properly, like using the quit button. It shuts down the node properly. And we actually will touch upon that when we discussing group process management, but no, you don't need to leave your data running until this is done. You can close it, and um, consolidation will continue next time you launch it. Great question, Sebastian. It's actually rather amazing. It will survive being stopped and restarted when you go through that. You guys put a lot of work into making it work correctly, because if something can possibly break, I'll probably end up breaking it by accident. <laughs> I, I closed mine a couple times. I My computer my main computer is a little bit slow and ancient. So yeah, I didn't have any issues, but I saw that, um, you know, starting node and stopping it. So yeah, users should feel safe. Users should feel safe. And the same goes for wallet restoration. So especially users who have a lot of wallets, they know they need to wait until restoration is completely done. It's always better to be done in Mongo, but we, we did extensive uh, QA and, um, we removed all of the issues we had. We had. So there, there should be no issues with closing that was and resuming later, both for consolidation of blockchain storage and for wallet restoration. Yeah, I've actually done it on my slower laptop uh, because it had a very long time on there. It was fine. I was, I was able to stop, restart. It was good to go. All right, so now that we have this update for Daedalus out, what's next? Is the next update going to be the cellular release? Or are we expecting more features in between? Can you kind of let us know about that? Uh, actually, we we are ha having a planning meeting uh, this Friday, but uh, there will be more stuff coming uh, before Shelly. Uh, one of the things is most probably we will, we will be changing key duration scheme. So uh, the wallets uh, we are currently using will, will actually become legacy wallets, and we will use the same Basically, we will use the same key duration scheme, uh, Euroi and Icarus are using. So that is one thing that will be happening before the Shelly releases. Can, can you address, this is kind of a separate question on a separate topic, but um, going back to the amount of work that it took to get this done, I'm sure that you put quite a few graveyard shifts to get this process done. Can you just explain to users how complicated and convoluted this process is and how much time your team has been putting towards making sure that this wallet runs smoothly and people can feel secure, their funds feel secure, and everything of that sort? It, it's, a, it's a very complicated process. Uh, this is a uh, complicated piece of software and engineering. And uh, as you saw, we actually decided to rewrite the wallet because it's a complicated piece of software. And it maybe didn't, didn't receive enough love initially when we were preparing the first mainnet release. We also didn't consider all of the edge cases and all specific use cases. For example, exchanges have wallets with thousands or millions of addresses. And you need to approach both development and testing differently. So it's just like a huge effort to do uh, everything properly. Additional complication is this is a desktop piece of software. That means uh, there are an, like limitless number of combination of operating systems and hardware and stuff, and a lot of very specific issues. And our support team is doing its best to help users and to catalog all the issues. And yeah, it's um, I mean, maybe you can ask something more specific. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but 
Uh, building a desktop uh, cryptocurrency wallet is big endeavor. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think Philippe was probably referring more to the order of magnitude of how many employees or how many uh, man hours it took. I'm sure it was pretty significant. But, you know, that was a good question to kind of segue into the next part of uh, this episode where um, Darko was speaking about the optimized block storage. And I think the next area is the improved process management management with uh, Nicola. Are we ready to move on to that section yet? I think we are. Um, okay. I'll give it over to Nicola. And I guess you need this. Thing. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. So uh, until now, that was actually, as, as you mentioned in, in, the, in the beginning, that was actually consists of two different modules or parts. So we have the Cardano SL and we, ha we have the front end component. And we also have a third one, uh, which is actually a process manager, uh, which is called Launcher. And in the previous DevOps versions, what we had there is Launcher was actually launching in the, independently DevOps front end and the Cardano node uh, processes. And then obviously DevOps needed to communicate with the Cardano node in order to sync with the blockchain in, and um, in the end enable you to actually use the blockchain in terms of creating transactions, wallets, etc. Uh, so this, this uh, kind of an approach uh, had a couple of issues because uh, the front end module didn't have much control or overview on what the Cardano node is actually doing in the, in the background, which was kind of apparent to the users when they were facing connecting to network issues and similar problems. One of the other problems was that the Cardano node used to use hard-coded port on which it actually ran the wallet backend API. And for example, in case that this port has already been used by a different process on your machine, when you launch Daedalus, uh, the Cardano node would actually be un unable to start. And therefore, the front end would be just stuck on the connecting to network screen, and you were unable to actually identify what the problem is. So what we decided to do is to change this architecture in a way that now the launcher actually is responsible only for launching the Daedalus front end process, and then we use uh, the IPC channel to actually start and control the Cardano node from within the Daedalus front end uh, module. Uh, what this enables us to do is to have more insight of what's going on with the Cardano node. So in the new version of Daedalus, you'll not only see the connecting to network screen briefly, hopefully, you will also see different state messages. For example, starting Cardano node, start, Cardano node started or stopping, updating, et cetera. An additional thing which improves the robustness of the system is the fact that now Cardano node will actually uh, be using dynamic port selection, which means that there's really a low chance that uh, once it starts, the port is already taken. And even if this happens, Delos will now recognize this problem and it will automatically restart the Cardano node. And obviously it will then use a different port, which will enable us to actually communicate with it. So all of these improvements should eliminate pretty much all of the connected network issues. And it will also offer us greater control over certain aspects of, uh, of DevOps usage. So for example, one of the screens which we already shown you in the, in the demonstration of the update mechanism. So when you see the update notification, when you click uh, update DevOps and restart, this check used to have certain issues where, for example, the Cardano node wouldn't exit in time. And then Daedalus will start applying, launch will start applying the update, which will then break uh, the, the, the whole cycle because the Cardano is still up and running. Uh, so now, since we have more control over the Cardano node, Daedalus will actually be able to identify at which current moment the Cardano node has completely exited, and only then it will actually trigger the, the update. So there are a lot of other cases where, where this new level of control comes in handy, but I would not like to go into more details than this. I think it's uh, sufficient for now, at least. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Can you explain what, uh, what NTP is? And also, that's a beautiful graphic. Did you, did you create that yourself? No, uh, this is actually a, a work of art of one of our uh, designers, um, Alexander. Uh, and you'll 
probably see something similar to this in the next release of Daedalus. Actually, this is kind of related to the one of the new screens which we have introduced in this version of Daedalus, which is um, named Network Status Screen. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. But in this in this chart, in this diagram, actually, you can see how the whole system is organized. So we have the launcher, which provides the launcher configuration and TLS certificates uh, to the Daedalus frontend and also to the Daedalus backend, which is actually the Cardano node. And then the Cardano node communicates with the frontend either using the wallet REST API or using the IPC channel. So IPC channel is used to control the node in terms of starting and stopping it and um, fetching the TLS certificates from the node, while the REST API is used to actually get all the information that we need to present you the UI in terms of showing your wallets, uh, creating transactions, stuff like that. And then again, we have the NTP check, uh, which is something which we will cover in the next section, but we can probably start with it right away. Um, so in order to uh, have a fully functional Cardano node and Daedalus as well, your local machine time needs to be in sync with the global NTP service time. Actually, it can be uh, up to 20 seconds uh, off, but in Daedalus code, we, we limit this offset to maximum of five, 15 seconds. Uh, why this is important is because of the network dynamics, obviously, because we have uh, on Cardano network, we have a new block generated every 20 seconds. And therefore, the time on your machine needs to be in sync um, with the global time in order for the syncing mechanism to actually work correctly. Um, so this is a di an additional check we have introduced um, in, in the latest version of Delos. Uh, actually, it's here since the last version, but we have improved it in a way that uh, when Delos launches, it will actually fetch the NTP time difference from the NTP service. And in case your local machine is off, your local machine time is off by more than 15 seconds, user will see a network NTP error screen stating that uh, the time is off and um, it will show what's the exact time difference. And obviously it will uh, point the user to how to fix the problem. Uh, there are certain situations where the NTP service is unreachable altogether, usually due to uh, firewall rules. So some of the firewalls tend to forbid uh, the communication to the NTP service. And therefore, we even detect this in Daedalus. And in case this is the case, we are actually unsure if the time is right. But we then explain this to the user. And the user can either check the time on his own, or he can fix the, the firewall problem uh, so that this uh, check works automatically again. And then we also have this network subscription. Obviously, your local Cardano node needs to communicate with the Cardano network to fetch all of the logs and stuff like that. And the third part is the support request. Um, so we have a handy feature in Daedalus where users can automatically uh, generate support requests by also attaching their uh, logs from Daedalus client. And then this actually ends up on our Zendesk server. And our support team then handles your request and helps you to resolve the issues. I would just, just to like to clarify something like uh, this is the work in progress, but this is the, the actual new screen users will have with Daedalus. So for users who, who want to see like under the hood, this is how under the hood will look like. So you'll be able to see like what's happening and you will also be able to see if something is wrong. For example, if the NTP check is failing or your clock is more than 20 seconds off, that part of the screen will indicate that there's something is wrong here. And if you if you click on the indication that something is wrong, you will be taking the portal article explaining how to fix the issue. So I think like this will be a very cool feature. Hopefully, if your most users won't need to use it, but they can always like look under the hood if they are interested, or if something is wrong, we'll present this screen. It will like help us with support because like if users just take the screenshot of this screen. We will have a pretty clear idea what's happening and what's wrong. And I also like linking to support portal articles. I think it will be I'll like eliminate users submitting support requests in the first time. So I think this will be like a very cool thing. And uh, it will be animated and cool and fun and stuff also. <laughs> Darko, that's pretty amazing. So in the future, this diagram may appear inside the wallet. Yeah, uh, this is basically the replacement for the network status screen, which has the same diagnostic information, and we'll show it. Um, do, you, do you think it maybe Nicole is now time to show the? Yeah, we, we can show it. Okay. Okay. I don't have my dead running. 
Let's Can I give it. a quick verbose description of this diagram? Basically, so for those that are listening, this diagram that he's showing here, check it out on YouTube. There are three primary external connections. You have a Zendesk server, which is where updates come from. Is that correct? Uh, no, no, no. Zendesk or, server is used to um, collect the support requests from the users using the okay. list. So yeah, uh, when, right. there, there is like submit support ticket feature in those. When you when you use that feature and you submit a support request, it goes to that channel. It goes to Cardano uh, reporting server. That will be eliminated in future, but uh, it will work differently. Okay, so the, the feature. So the three primary external connections is the Zendesk server shown at the top center. On the right hand side, you have NTP server for time. On the bottom right hand side, you have Cardano network, which is the actual transaction uh, across the network. So basic quick summary there. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. What was the next thing you were going to show? I will bring over the screen. We won't be covering it in detail, but there is a new menu item here, network status. Uh, and it's actually something we built for like our own usage for development. But we will convert it to this cool screen we just showed you. So maybe, Mikola, if you want to add something here. Yeah, so so when we when we started with this uh, restructuring of the way that Devils actually works with the under underlying uh, Cardano node, we kind of needed a, a debug tool for us as developers to kind of identify all, all the different states that we now need to manage from within the Devils code. Um, so out of this necessity, we have created this screen, which is kind of a debug screen, primarily used for for us as developers, but also maybe for some expert users. Uh, so in this screen, we, we, you can see two different columns. So on the left side, we have devil status, and on the right side, we have the Cardano node status. So this kind of shows you uh, what is happening under the hood. And we need those two columns. We have a chart, which is automatically updated, which presents you the uh, syncing progress. So uh, we have, obviously, a local block and a network block heights. And as I already mentioned, the network block height increases every 20 seconds and then our local node actually needs to download the new block uh, and sync up with the network block height here in the left column you can see what are the exact numbers of blocks in the local and network block heights just by looking at these numbers we can also um, tell you more about the logic underneath so for example uh, when you start devils initially you see this sync progress rising and once the local block height reaches up to I think it's six blocks difference with the network block height. We consider that was to be synced, so we tolerate up to six block unsynced blocks uh, in the system. Uh, so you can see here now we have one block. Now it's back to zero, and we also need to measure what's the time timestamp or, or let's say the age of the last received network block height to determine that the blocks are rising constantly, which is quite important. We have also different states of the Cardano node. So for example, on the right side we can see. If the Cardano node is subscribed, so this is not subscribed, actually tells us if it's connected to in, in this chart, if it's actually connected to the Cardano network on the bottom. It also tells you if the node time is correct. So we can see the exact time here. So this is the time difference. So now when I click this link, it actually triggered the request to the NTP servers, and we got a different response this time. And of course, we also have here different variables which tell us if the node is actually syncing in the background, or is if, it, if it's already synced. Uh, and we can even try to restart if there's an issue. For example, in this case, everything is operating normally. So we see all these green uh, green marks. But in case there is an issue with the system, then some of them may appear in red. Uh, and then you could probably try to simply restart the current node by use of this thing here, restart, uh, which will then probably or maybe fix the problem. So maybe if I try to do it now, you'll see how these variables change. So I'll click restart. So you can see that the kernel is stopped. Now it's starting, and now it's running again. And as it actually now boots up, you will see how these variables change. So finally, it got subscribed. And I will see that it started syncing again as soon as it uh, fetches the network block height. And in that moment, uh, devil status will show here as connected, and we will see the syncing screen. So now it's actually on this blue screen, uh, and the variables have just changed. So we're back in uh, in a running state where everything is green again. So yeah, in the future, we'll make this screen much more pre pretty and more informative because you know we primarily target devils for expert users and uh, anyone who wants to know more about 
what's happening under the hood will be actually able to learn about this. And also, it's quite important for us in terms of uh, helping our users, because just as Dark already mentioned, by sending a screenshot of this screen, uh, the support team and us as developers will already, just by looking at it, be able to probably tell what's wrong with the system. Uh, but it's not just about making the screen pretty. We will also uh, invest a lot of efforts into, into making Devilus able to auto -reco recover from any of these potential issues, same as we did with the, with the Cardano uh, process. Back to you, Darko. Thanks, Nicola. So any questions here? So, oh, this obviously may look intimidating for most of the users. That's why we are changing to something like this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, th I think this was a very good visual representation. I've um, messed around with that network status page. And once you once you look at the graph and you understand that basically it's Daedalus's version of syncing up with the main Cardano blockchain. And, you know, if you're having network issues, this is a diagnostic tool for people to to see exactly what's going wrong. And, you know, like you were mentioning before, that time difference, you can figure out whether or not that time difference is affecting your computer that you're running Daedalus on. So I thought that was pretty good. Rick, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to ask him to click on that link that says uh, statistics monitor. Uh, <laughs> what does that do? Uh, this links to the e EKG of Cardano node. Guys, I wanted to ask you a question, separate question, because we like to ask all our guests. So Darko, Nicola, and Matthias, what brought you to Cardano? Why? How'd you get here? Each of you has the floor. Um, maybe I should go first. So actually, I, I got to Cardano uh, by accident. I was doing freelance projects, and I was uh, looking for a new gig. And one of my uh, colleagues, we worked together on uh, open source projects. He was working for Cardano. Uh, he was working only on one small piece of software called uh, Ada Voucher Vending Machine. And the project was ending in three months, but I said, OK, I'll join anyway. I didn't know. What um, IHK or Cardano was, and, and the team was very small. There was like less than 20 of us, and majority of people were contractors, subcontractors. And then, like by by pure chance, uh, Charles uh, Hoskinson saw a new name on Slack, and first company meetup where uh, everyone in the company gets together was happening in Riga, Latvia. And Charles asked me some questions, and he said, "You sound like a smart guy. Can you come to Latvia tomorrow?" And that's what I did. And the story started. It was like more than two years ago. <laughs> That's an epic story. Epic story. Well, my, mine was um, uh, quite simple. Darko br brought me on board. So, <laughs> so actually, we met uh, on, I think, in the JavaScript developer yeah, group actually, in Zagreb. And, yeah, um, I posted, um, I was looking for new developers. <laughs> to join uh, IHK, and I posted an ad on uh, Slack channel for local JavaScript meetups. And that's how I met Nicola. Yeah, that's in short. Cool, you knew someone. So Nicola, how about you? How'd no, you that, get was, that was Nicola. We need Matthias now. Oh, Matthias, I met Matthias. Thank you, Nicola. Matthias, <laughs> what's up? Well, uh, I was doing freelance for a couple of years and mostly focusing on Haskell and functional programming stack. And I had this colleague at some point who was really into crypto and especially Bitcoin actually. And he was like constantly, you know, bragging about that and how we should uh, get involved. So at some point I started maybe listening to him. <laughs> and because we're both developers, we, you know, we try to figure out a way to get involved into those things. And at that time I was like, yeah, it would be nice if I could just, you know, have, find a way to contribute to the crypto space, but still continue working on Haskell and functional programming uh, tech. So I started to research a bit and obviously found Cardano and IOHK. And I got really interested in the project, especially, well, for all the proof of stake aspects and like all the approach also. That was really like reminding me of um, well, school and all the stuff, you know, you see when you're doing your academic studies, but never then uh, get to use in actual industry. So I find it very interesting. And then, well, basically applied, get there and, uh, well, got really involved in the project. And 
that's all good now pretty much yeah good you saw iohk was doing it right yeah exactly i was interested in your approach and thought okay i want to be part of it so let's get there good deal thanks for the story so i think this brings us to the last segment of this episode there's a portion here where Darko was going to go over link to known issues in Daedalus and the support portal. Did we uh, touch on that, or did you want to segue into that? Um, yeah, let's let's do that right now. Um, this last piece will be like very brief. Uh, so um, we have this uh, settings page in Daedalus, and there is support page, and kind of like a minor change, but I will use it to introduce support portal. Previously, this was linking to the. Uh, the, the link is known issues, and it was linking to uh, FAQ page on the Daedalus website. Now it's linking to an article on support portal, and uh, support portal is uh, fairly new. It will be used to support all, all of IOHK products, and this is like um, from a landing page for Daedalus wallet. So you have cool stuff like overview instructions for usage and most of the content is available in Japanese and English feature explanation help there is also like the article I just mentioned uh, known issues uh, there is also ability to to give feedback to um, every piece of content here by clicking the like buttons which helps the support team was this our article helpful yes no uh, we we kind of um, wanted to just to, to show that all all of the content will be living in support portal from now, uh, and we are moving the stuff away from the web page. It's easier to maintain, it's easier to translate, it's easier to update, and we will get the support team in one of the next post podcasts hopefully here, so they can actually explain support portal in, in more more detail. And uh, I would like to also to to mention that there is feature request section here uh, and I, I encourage users to, to go there if they they have features they would like to, to request so we, we are watching this section and uh, we'll be introducing new features based on user feed, feedback also that feature request is an outstanding way of getting community feedback on what they would like to see implemented in Daedalus is that what that's there for yeah exactly nice Awesome. Awesome. All right. Did that cover everything you wanted to put out on the uh, support portal, Darko? We're approaching yeah. about the time of the podcast to wrap up. You got anything else you'd like to tell the users about or tell the viewers about? The users are many. The viewers and the listeners on the podcast? And this is about it. I just wanted just to maybe briefly mention the, the testnet. So uh, recently we, we launched the test network and... Um, we have uh, testnet builds of those, then they can run alongside the mainnet one. Uh, so the icon is a bit different. It's it's red and it's um, it's uh, it has TN indicating the testnet. And there is a Cardano testnet website. So it's Cardano testnet website where users can uh, get some uh, testnet data. So why is this important? This is important because this is a very nice like tool to to educate users. So users can actually download testnet version of the DLS. They are not risking any funds. It's quote, quote, uh, fake data. And there is testnet faucet, which can send you some fake data. So I can actually demo that very quickly. If I go to my receive screen and I generate a new address or use the one I have now, right now, I can go to testnet faucet which basically dispenses ADA. I can put in my address here, check this. So uh, Fossey can verify that I'm not a robot and I click request. I get this success message and my wallet will receive some ADA in a minute. So it's a very cool tool uh, for users to experiment, to learn without risking funds. They can delete their wallets, restore them, here is the transaction uh, from the faucet. It's now in the pending state. So it's a very cool learning tool. It also helps us uh, find bugs. So uh, we'll be releasing all of our updates to testnet first. And after a period of testing on testnet, we will be releasing the features on the mainnet. 
Darko, that was a fantastic real-time live demo that you just kind of pulled right out of the air there. I appreciate that. <laughs> I admire anybody who is willing to do a live demo on air. It's awesome. Uh, it's difficult to pull off. So uh, that what you just did there, the test demo, let's say myself as a non-developer, is it helpful if I go on the test net and I download the wallet and I, I use it? I'm just a regular user. Is that kind of information useful to you guys as the developers because I'm putting some sort of strain on the network as the average person. You'll get to see what, what that that strain does to the network. Is, is it useful in some way? Yeah, exactly. It's useful for that and many other reasons. So we'll be launching new features on, on the, the testnet first. Uh, like for until uh, until this public testnet, we were using our staging network, which, which was not public. So the only people using it were devel developers and QA. If you add public users, uh, you just get much more, much more inputs, and you can figure out the issues much, much more, much, much easier. Especially performance issues, or just the bugs in uh, feature, unreleased features. And like the, the the other very useful purpose of the testing is, if you are integrating with Cardano, if you are a business or an exchange or any like entity you want. Who wants to integrate uh, with Cardano? You can actually use it to test and find. So you can develop your integration against Cardano API using testing software and fake AI. You don't need to buy some ADA to to execute tests and pay fees, transaction fees, and stuff like that. Uh, there was one last thing that was a form submission with enter key that you guys had on your outline of stuff you want to cover. Did you want to? Go into that, or do you want to save it for another podcast where we go more into the support portal and how that's uh, used? It's very quick. You previously, when submitting forms, that helps you would need to push a button. Now you can also use enter key on your keyboard. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. okay. I got okay. you. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I guess we're wrapping this up. This is. Um... Um, we went over, we went just over our time, but that's fine as long as the users feel comfortable with um, Daedalus. So, you know, I have, I'll have i let uh, Nicola, Darko, and Matthias have the last words. But I want to thank everyone for joining us for the Cardano Effect podcast, episode eight. This was a special edition. We were going over the Cardano 1.4 release. It's really something that they've put a lot of work into. So I know it's the holidays. It's December. But I recommend that if you are a Cardano enthusiast or you are an ADA holder or you are a long-term investor or you just see yourself within this ecosystem long-term, get familiar with Daedalus. So over the holidays, over the quarter one of next year, go to DaedalusWallet.io, download it. You know, even, even if you're not technically savvy, the developers here, they're building products, they're building solutions, so it's more usable, it's more user-friendly for everyday people. And the barrier to entry is gonna just decrease and decrease. So your homework is to download Daedalus if you haven't done so already. It's really, I know crypto is very scary, but Cardano is doing it correct, and it's very important for you to be familiar with this portal, especially if you want to participate in all the activities that Cardano will be releasing next year. When and the next big release will be Shelly. So that's the staking, that's the staking platform. So Rick, Sebastian, thank you for co-hosting this. Nicola, Darko, Matthias, thanks for joining us. If you have any last words, I'll leave it up to you. Otherwise, thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone. See you in the next one. Um, I just like to add a lot of cool stuff is coming in uh, next year, so stay tuned. <laughs> Bye all. <laughs> <laughs>